Good evening. Great to see you all here this evening for this special screening of Atlantics. I'm Zoe Elton, Director of Programming at Mill Valley Film Festival and co-conspirator of Mind the Gap. <laughs> um, prime suspect? I'm the prime suspect? <laughs> I am Mind the Gap's prime suspect. Um, this, of course, is a perfect Mind the Gap film. Matty Diop uh, was the first black woman to have a film in the main competition at Cannes. That was this year. So not only that, she won the grand prize there. So really interesting. But not only that, she comes from a really interesting heritage. Um, her uncle was the uh, filmmaker Jibril Jotmambeti. And if you're not familiar with his work, his film Hyenas, I, I don't talk about favorites very much because, you know, one doesn't. It's like making favorites of your children. His film Hyenas is one of my all-time favorite films in the universe. And his brother, Wasis Diop, uh, was the composer for that film, and he is Matty Diop's father. So she comes from a really interesting heritage, both as uh, a filmmaking heritage and also as a musical heritage. We have a very special guest following the screening, her composer. So I, I kind of love it because it's not very often that you get a chance to actually talk about how we hear films. Um, so welcome to this screening. Big thanks to Netflix, not just for the film, but also for the popcorn. Um, and have a great screening, and we will see you afterwards for the Q&A. Take care. Please join me in welcoming composer Fatima Al-Kadiri. Hey. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> good. I, you know, I, it's so great. I, it's so rare that we actually get to talk with a composer. You know, it's like usually we have a director here or an actor, that kind of thing. But um, it, I think it sort of opens the door to experiencing a film in a completely different way. So I would love you to talk a little bit about how you got involved with the film. I understand that Matty found you on Facebook. She Is did. <laughs> So when she contacted you, um, what did she say? I mean, did she describe the project? Where was it at? What was she asking you? Um, she contacted me three years ago on my Facebook fan page, oh, gosh. which I very badly, rarely reply to. Um, but she wrote a very long email talking about how she was a huge fan of my music and that this film is in the early stages and mm -hmm. I'm the person that she wants to make, um, uh, that she wants to be her composer. And uh, I was like, okay. And then a year passes and then her um, producer contacts my manager and is like, okay, the script is ready to read now. Huh. Um, you know, can she read it? Let us know what she thinks. And I remember reading the PDF of the script in, um, in the doctor's office. I was getting like a comprehensive blood test and was waiting for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and just reading, reading the script. And I'd never read a script before. Um, I'm a huge film buff, but I had never, ever thought to read a script and it's kind of very dry you know the dialogue scenes I just I couldn't imagine this as a completed film actually that's a really interesting observation because you're right I mean you know when you it, films are basically sound and, and picture so when you see it on a page there's a huge leap of faith or a huge leap of the imagination to get you to that point. So what, how, was, how did your leap of faith happen in terms of getting you to that point? Basically, after I read the script, I was like, okay, I'm interested, but 
I want to see something before I fully agree to do this. You right, know, right, I want right. to see s- some kind of very rough edit of some shooting. Yeah. The year after that, so this is in the third year, this is last um, October, she shot the entire... Or no, sorry, after I read the script, she came to, to Berlin maybe a month later. Which is where you live, right? Yeah, yeah, to meet me in person and to talk. And um, and she had come from... From Paris. Paris, that's right, yeah. So she came to my apartment, we chatted, uh, she showed me some videos, she talked about what, you know, the kind of direction that she wanted um, for the music in the film. Um, she wanted me to give her a folder of music while she was shooting. So she hadn't started shooting yet. We met in, I want to say, October two years ago, and she started shooting the film in January uh, of the following year. Hmm. So so that sounds like she was offering you a chance to be collaborative in a way that many filmmakers would not necessarily, you know, open that door to their composer. I mean, it sounds like you were sort of collaborating from the get-go. Is that true or not? I mean, I didn't know her. And <laughs> I, I only collaborate right. with people that I know right. and I'm friends with. Right. So it was, she wanted me to collaborate with her, but, but you she didn't was know a stranger her. to me, you right, know? Right. Like, and, um, but she was very persistent. She had, you know, she, she knew that no one else was going to fit this movie, and I only understood that after I watched the rough edit of the film. Wow. You know? So the film was also based on a short film that she had done. Had you seen her short film? No. And she didn't share it with you? She did, but she had she shared but with me all her films, short and medium right. format, and I was finishing an album at the time, I'm like, okay, I'm going to skim, right. skim this. You know? <laughs> but I agreed to it. Like, tentatively, I agreed to it. And I told her, you know, I'm interested for sure, et cetera, but I need to see. You I need, need to, to see more. To so you know. were auditioning her, essentially. I think we were auditioning each other. Right. Even <laughs> though she, you know, she, she wanted me to do it. It's still, it's a negotiation at the end of the Was day. Was there a know? point where you got excited about it? It's when I saw the, the rough edit. Ah. Yeah, when I saw, uh, when I saw the opening... Um, the opening scene of the credits where the the men are on the truck, you know, the yeah. sea passing the by. I was like, yeah. okay, I, I'm in, you know. I yeah. was actually on tour when she gave me the, the finally when I got the, the rough um, edit and I was in Tokyo and I just started composing um. feverishly to it, you know. There's... It, the f- the place where the film really got me was at the beginning when, when you see their eyes lock between the... Uh, the train going by. I mean, that's just such a beautiful moment. Was that in the rough edit? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, was there. <laughs> um, it's an intriguing film because it, it's unconventional and it's completely original. And it goes from being basically a love story, you know, I mean, just this beautiful connection between these two young people. But it also has, you know, it has that sense of, um, you know, looking at capitalism and the effect in Dakar um, on these people. It has to do with people who are, uh, I mean, essentially leaving as refugees to try and find a better life. I mean, there's a lot of, there's this amazing uh, sort of grasp of, the spectrum of humanity that many people in many places in the world are living with. And then there's the ghost thing. The you know, gin right? element. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, as a composer, did you feel like you had to be working with different things thematically with that part of it the thi- the funny thing is that every theme in the film i had made a record about i had already made a full-fledged album about about gin about social justice uh. about falling in love so sh- everything was in my remit you know oh that's interesting <laughs> yeah so but she knew that already because she had mm. already known right what i did and that was you know th- um 
that's her ingenuity. She just understood that I was that the right the person. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, from a very, in a very practical way, how did you work with, so you saw a rough cut. How did you work with um, composing music that would connect with specific parts of the film or specific tonal elements of the film? I mean, were you sitting uh, on a soundstage matching... They're not okay. Oh my God! You should see the. <laughs> this was not Skywalker sound. This is the <laughs> most basic setup in the history of film. I think you know it's um, a computer and a controller keyboard, which is an empty keyboard with virtual instruments from the computer, and two speakers on some um, freezer boxes. That, that's my setup. Wow, cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's very rudimentary. Yeah. So, but were you matching um, music to picture? Yes, I basically looped each scene. So, Matty had a rough idea of, she, when she gave me the rough edit, it was filled with reference music. You know, this mm. is a scene for the score, mm. this is a scene for the score. But she also asked me, if there's any scenes that you think would benefit from having a score, let me know as well, you know? Right. But I mainly replace. I, I started, the beginning of the process was to replace the reference music mm. and then fill in anything else that I thought needed um, right. music. Right. So that gave you a lot of creative leeway. Oh, definitely. That's great. For sure. I mean, but it's also to work with a fan. I think that's the only way for musicians to work with yeah. directors. You right. ha the director has to respect the musician and vice versa. You know, there right. has to be, it's ultimately, it's a marriage, you know? It's like when the sound and the visual are so complementary, are so in love with each other, mm. it's, you know, that's the magic of cinema. Right, right. And of course, she is a musician's daughter. But she's also, you know, she's a DJ as well. So she's oh, a selector, okay. you know? Ah, she. Okay. Like, for instance, I, uh, a <coughs> lot of people have asked me about the, the scene of the wedding mm -hmm. where you have this loop, mm. um, which is a track I gave her while she was shooting. And she made an edit of it. She looped the intro. This is a very long piece of music. She looped it? She looped the intro and she showed it to me. <laughs> and she, w she was so cute. She was like, please don't kill me. I edited your music. She was terrified when she showed it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that showed her like how much she respected me as a musician, right, you know, that yeah. she was scared that I would be angry. Yeah, yeah. And then I saw it and I was like, it's perfect, you yeah. know? And I would yeah. have never thought to have looped this track. It would have never occurred to me, you know? But that shows you that she is a selector. She's a DJ. She right. knows how to mess with music. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Were you familiar with her father's music? No. A are you familiar with him now? I yes, mean, definitely. Yeah. I've met him, you know. Yeah. I, I'm definitely familiar with him now. Yeah. And I was just saying, you know, when we started this, it's, um, her uncle's film, Hyenas, is one of my all-time favorite films. I mean, it's just an amazing film. And a part of the reason for that is her dad's music. I mean, it's, it's also a really smart film and, you know, beautiful in so many ways. But, um, I mean, I had the soundtrack from that film. You know, I, I, I may still have it somewhere, but it's on a CD and I don't have anything to play CDs anymore. But, um, but it's, it's definitely a sort of seminal piece of, of uh, film soundtrack for me but um yeah it's uh that's an interesting family i mean it's just, just kind of great that she's sort of carrying on that family tradition and it's also intriguing i mean you're from kuwait but you were you 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 had you know the first two years of your life were in dakar where this film is shot but you've never been back there no did she know that you had... She knew. Oh, God. Yes, okay. she knew. And She had um, your number. She knew for sure. And it was very... I always think about this being um, just providence, you know, how mm. you're born somewhere. And then the first... It's been my dream as a, a child to score a film since I was a little kid. I, wa I knew I wanted to score really? a film. Really? Yes, oh, absolutely. Great. And... Uh, 
where is the first movie located in the city of my birth? It, uh, I was telling her earlier, it could have been Gambia, it could have been Mauritania, it could have been the Ivory Coast, but it was Dakar, you know? Like, there, it's yeah. so specific yeah. that it has to be Providence. Yes, true. Um, I'd love to see if there are some questions from the audience. Sure. Can we run a mic for you, Zoe? You go, oh, that would be great. Thanks, Dan. So, questions? Questions. If not, we can just keep on talking and you can interrupt. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let me get this for you real quick. Hold on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple. You, I know nothing about music for films other than loving, loving it when I hear it. So you said something about you replaced the music that was there with your own. Are you saying that when they, when she first filmed it all, that she had some kind of music in there and it was just like a placeholder and then you put yours in? Basically, I think most directors, not all of them, but a lot of directors use reference music. That's what you called it. Uh, yeah. As a way of helping editing, you know? So they have to start editing the film and they usually do it with some kind of reference music that sometimes stays in the film and sometimes is replaced because directors have a tendency to get married to the reference music as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I do have one more if it's all right. Do, please, um, yeah. So are you saying, uh, you described how you did it with uh, the keyboard and, and uh, representing every instrument and the speakers on the freezers or whatever. Are you saying that was the final music that was composed by you as you did that? Yes. So it wasn't redone later by an orchestra? No. There's no orchestral any, uh, no. Holy mackerel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> There's also, I, I mean, it's in the beginning and I think it's in the end. Is it, what's that, you know, the, the thumbed instrument? Yes. The, the balafon, it's is called, it? No. It's called a, a honer guitarette. Oh. Yeah, and it's... And that was a, an actual, that wasn't an electronic version? No, no, it's okay. an electronic version. Oh, okay. I only use VSTs and they are virtual instruments. Um, you only use what? VST. VST, do we know what that is? It's a virtual instrument. Oh, okay. So basically it's, um, they're called plugins and any synthesizer, anything, any, any mm. sound can be a virtual instrument. And that's how I compose because I've, I've just been composing like that for a very long time. Interesting. Huh. Yes, a question here. Uh, I, I, I am uh, amazed at how, how that soundtrack turned out. Uh, and, and since you say it, it's pretty much the thing that you were, you were striving to do your entire life, uh, how, would, how easy would you say it was to do that? And, and you know. It's definitely the hardest thing I've had to do. Because my whole life I've been making music without feedback. You know, it's all mm. self-directed. Nobody's giving me feedback. I give it to the record label. Here you go, release it. You know, um, nobody dares gives me feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and to work with a director, it's their vision. At the end of the day, it's not my vision. I have to. You know, they are negotiating their vision with a small army of people, the cast and the crew, and um, you know, rewriting a scene uh, fifteen times or ten times can be really bad for your ego. You know? oh. But I trust her. She, ha she wants a certain mood. She, ha she has a certain vibe. But the problem is expressing what she wants. You know? How can you express in words exactly? And there was a language barrier. Her English is not that great. My French is not that great. And um, I was the only member of the entire cast and crew that didn't speak French. They would send emails in French and then a text message to me translating <laughs> it in English. So <laughs> I definitely, um, there was a lot of, uh, but the thing is, the fact that she was a fan at the end of the day, uh, like it gave me some freedom because I would put my foot down at some point and be like, this is right for the seed, trust me, you know? <laughs> but sometimes, like for instance with the reference music, there was one scene I just couldn't replace. I wrote 20 pieces for it, mm. and uh, she just kept saying, oh no, it's not right, it's not. And then at the end of the day, I was like, listen, 
keep the reference music. You're obviously married to it. I won't be offended, and I'm not. You know what I mean? It's like this is a very meaningful piece of music for this scene for her. This is how she cut it, and it's just not going to be replaced by anybody. You know? Hmm. It was the Ada's walk where Ada is walking on the beach after um, going to the nightclub and not finding Suleiman there. Question back here. Uh, it was lovely. It was a lovely, lovely piece. I'm so glad we're talking about this. Um, I'm very curious about, I haven't been to Dakar for many, many years, and I'm curious about uh, where you filmed it. Was this an, um, in what area of Dakar? Is this sort of a new suburban area or an old place in the community or where? I wouldn't know because I wasn't there when they filmed it. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. That's very interesting. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's a wonderful film. Uh, we both agree. Everybody else, I'm sure, thinks so, too. Uh, do you uh, know if the story or any parts of it, the ghost parts, the man at sea coming back and being there, you know, as women instead trying to get something, is that based on any legend, you know, local or anything like that? No, I don't, I, I don't believe so. It almost felt to me like it was like an ancestor thing. I mean, I know that it wasn't, but... You know, just that whole, it was fascinating. I mean, it was, it was I, I think, you know, I mean, I remember when it was shown in Cannes, there were people who found that really challenging to take on. I mean, it requ the, the thing is... Because people needed sort of a, an explanation for it. The thing is with jinn, the word jinn, uh, they are... Jinn as in genie, right? Yes, yeah. genie is singular, jinn is the plural, and... They are supernatural beings. They are not ghosts, technically. You know, they are mm. anything. They can be anything. Um, and I recently read this um, book of Arab mythology, and there is a rank, jinn being the lowest rank of supernatural being, which is fascinating. Um, really? Yeah, but basically, they have a special position because they're mentioned in the Quran. So you cannot be a true believer if you don't believe in jinn, because it's mentioned in the Quran. Really? Yes, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So the belief is that there are supernatural beings around us. They uh, possess, they can possess anything and can take mm -hmm. any form. So they're shapeshifters. Uh, and, nor, and they can be benign and they can be evil. They can be anything. Um, Just like So people. they're... <laughs> So this is the thing. She is showing benign jinn. Mm. She is showing jinn that are coming back for justice um, to get their mm. unpaid wages, which is very rare. Anytime jinn are represented in film or TV, it's normally the evil variety. You know? Mm. Another question right here. Yep. <coughs> I am so delighted to have a composer here. So thank you to Zoe um, and also for all of her Mind the Gap, pick, you know, and women and, uh, and, and Netflix. everyone, <laughs> and Netflix, everybody. Um, <clears throat> the music was so haunting, and it really is so memorable. I'll, I'll remember that vibration always, I think, because it was so strong and like a character. So thank you for, um, I mean, that painted the, pic you know, helped tell the story. Um, amazingly beautifully and it was my question has to do with um, if you might know <laughs> there's a scene where one of the jean, how do you pronounce G the jinn jinn um, when she's leaving the house after you know um, warning him uh, that you know they're all gonna <laughs> meet at the cemetery and when she turns around you know you see clearly that she has a shirt on that is the number 13 and the stars and I immediately thought in, in the line with social, social justice that perhaps there's a code message about the 13 colonies and being that maybe Senegal uh, uh, is a colony, you know, of France and just, uh, you know, a, a little poke at the towers, you know, maybe the <laughs> uh, possible Trump towers, the towers. And, you know, I mean, I really <laughs> went off on it, but I actually... I, the tower itself is called, in the very beginning of the film, you could completely miss it when they're in the construction um, 
managers like a hut in the middle of the construction site. There is a poster behind him that says the name of the tower. The tower is called Mu'ajiza Tower. Mu'ajiza is an Arabic word. And she chose it very specifically. It means miracle tower. And it's the only CGI in the entire film. It's not real. Um, which is interesting, where the jinn are real and the tower is an illusion. Um, and this is actually a comment about the money that is pouring in to African countries all over the continent mm -hmm. from other countries, China, the Gulf. And uh, for instance, she had told me that when Gaddafi was alive, there were so many Libyan, major Libyan uh, development projects in Senegal. So this is a, uh, a, a comment about this new colonial money. Wow. Well, I believe the soundtrack is coming out this week. It is, on Friday. On Friday. So if you love the music as much as I do, you will be able to have it in your own homes. Um, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, please, yeah, join us downstairs. We have a reception for you. Awesome. That's great. Thank you all. Let's see you downstairs. <laughs>